All right. Well, turn with me to Luke chapter 16. We're having a little problem with our sound system, but it's actually this microphone is working. So praise God. But we may not. We may be doing a the last song a cappella here. So Luke chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 1. And it says, Now he, Jesus, was also saying to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, or a steward, and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management. For you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do, so that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. Verse 5, And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. Then he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. And then he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he acted shrewdly. This parable can be taken out of context very easily. Jesus is not telling his disciples, including us, he's not telling us to embezzle or rip off our employers. A parable is a word illustration. It's a picture. It's not a riddle. Uh, it's a word picture used to help illustrate a point. In this particular parable, Jesus is using a negative example to paint a positive picture for his disciples, including us. So let's get the context here. Jesus is still at this meal that he was invited to in chapter 14 of the Gospel of Luke. You may remember. And if you remember, when he first arrived, he sat down. There was a man sitting right in front of him suffering from dropsy or water retention, usually caused by congestive heart failure. So this guy was dying. This was a setup by the Pharisees. They wanted to see if Jesus would once again heal an ill person on the Sabbath day right in front of the leaders of the Pharisees. Jesus healed the man and then proceeded to ask the Pharisees which one of them would not save their drowning child or their drowning animal if they fell into a well on the Sabbath day. And none of them answered Jesus because they would all serve themselves on the Sabbath day by saving their own child or their own animal, but they were not willing to heal or save others on the Sabbath day. Jesus then tells them not to exalt themselves, but to humble themselves. Jesus tells them to invite people to their dinner party that are not capable of inviting you back. That would be you investing your resources in yourself. Not, not only am I exalting myself in my generosity by hosting this dinner, I'll be receiving another dinner in return, investing in myself. In other words, don't give someone dinner because you know they're going to give you dinner back in return. He's saying invest your resources in others, not expecting payback to yourself. This speaks of the motive behind the invite. Jesus is not saying we can't invite friends and family over for dinner, even if they do invite us back for dinner. He's speaking to the motive. Don't invite them over to proudly display your generosity and then obligate the person to invite you back so you get a free dinner out of it. We're reviewing all of this because it all goes together. The subject of Jesus' teaching all goes together at this dinner party. Jesus then shares this parable about a man giving a big dinner, and then he sends his servant out to tell all the invited guests that the time has come. And all the invited guests, they gave lame excuses why they didn't want to come have dinner with this master, this rich man. So he invited everyone to come to his dinner and compelled them to come. So the picture of this parable is God not only inviting his chosen people, the Hebrews, to join him in his kingdom for all eternity, but he has invited everyone, even the poor, even the lame, even the crippled, even the blind. He said, go along the hedges or along the back alleys and invite everyone to be a part of my dinner. Okay, so far, Jesus heals a complete stranger. 
He gives a complete stranger new life. Jesus tells them to humble themselves. Jesus tells them to invest their resources in those that can't repay you. Jesus tells them that God has invited everyone to be part of his kingdom. Then Jesus explains the cost of being one of his disciples, the cost of being one of his followers. Jesus says that his disciples have to choose him over their own family. In other words, if the family gives them an ultimatum and says, hey, it's going to be either us or this Jesus guy, he says, if you're going to be one of my disciples, you're going to have to pick me over them. It doesn't mean you write, off, write your family off. It, doesn't, it, it means you continue to love them, you continue to pray for them, and you continue to seek opportunity to share Jesus with them. You don't remove yourself from them, their lives, but if they, they may remove themselves from yours. Expounding upon this counting the cost of being one of his disciples, he goes on to say in chapter 14, verse 33, So then... None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Jesus is going to expound upon this even further in our lesson today. And we'll get there in just a minute. So after Jesus tells them to count the cost of discipleship, he then gives them three parables about seeking the lost, as Pastor Bob taught us so well last week. The first parable was about the lost sheep. And you remember Jesus concludes it by saying, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Then Jesus talks about the lost coin and concludes, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus talks about the prodigal son, concluding that this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and he's been found and they begin to celebrate. Okay, so here it is so far, this context. Jesus risks his own life by healing this complete stranger. He gives this complete stranger new life. Jesus then tells them to humble themselves by putting others first. Jesus tells them to invest their resources in those that can't repay you back. Jesus tells them that God has invited everyone to be part of his kingdom. Then Jesus explains the cost of being one of his disciples. Not only must we be willing to give up friends and family if it comes to it, but we must be willing to give up all our own possessions. Then in triplicate, triplicate, Jesus states how critically important every single lost person is to God. Using this word picture of God the Father running across the front yard with open arms to receive and embrace even the worst of us. To receive and embrace us into his household, into his kingdom. And now Jesus shifts his attention from the Pharisees to his disciples. And he says in verse six, chapter 16, verse 1 again, Now he was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and this manager, or this steward, was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager." Okay, so Jesus starts off this word picture with a rich man that has a manager or a steward. This is the same word used to describe Joseph. You remember when he was sold into Egypt and he managed the entire household of his master there, of the captain of the guard. This is a steward that is running all the resources that the manager, the master has. Psalm 24.1 tells us, the earth, speaking about masters and owners, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. 1 Peter 4.10 says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Ephesians 5.15 says, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time. 
making the most of your time because the days are evil. Colossians 5, 4, 5 says, conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, you have to give up all your own possessions. In reality, we don't actually have our own possessions. The earth and all it contains belongs to the Lord. We don't even belong to ourselves. We belong to God. We are his possession. So when we become a disciple of Jesus, we are choosing to rightfully acknowledge that we do, in fact, belong to him. And all the stuff we have, we rightfully acknowledge that God is the true owner. That God has appointed us as, a, as stewards or managers of his stuff. It's not that all the stuff didn't belong to God already. It did. It's just we were deceiving ourselves into thinking it belonged to us. And when we become a disciple of Jesus, we need to be willing to acknowledge the truth. That it all belongs to God. Including us. Our lives. Including our time. Our gifts and our abilities. Even every opportunity with others we just read. All of our resources belong to God. So in this word picture that Jesus is using, he says the manager was squandering or wasteful or careless with the master's possessions. And he says the time is coming very soon when you will no longer be a manager or steward of my possessions. And you will give an account of what you did with my possessions. Romans 4.10 says, But you... Why do you judge your brother? Or again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. We too will be giving an account. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be re recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. And if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. So do you see how we can apply this parable to us as believers in Jesus, as disciples of Jesus? As disciples, we admit the truth, that everything, including ourselves, belongs to God. Therefore, we're not the owners of our stuff, but on the contrary, God has given us stewardship over those resources. God has made us a manager over certain resources that belong to him, including physical resources, money, wealth, as well as time and talents and abilities. It's all given to us by God. And there will be a day coming very soon when we step out of these physical bodies and are no longer a steward or manager of the resources that are involved with these physical bodies. So our time is very limited. Best case scenario, it's very limited. You know, when you're a kid, it seems like forever to get to 20 years old. And you hit 20 and, you know, it's basically the first quarter of life is over, of physical life. But you still got three quarters of game play left, right? Then from 20 to 40, it's like time goes a little quicker. So you may get to 40, roughly half time of the game, but you still, you still have a whole, whole half of gameplay left. Think about the big game this afternoon. Uh, they come back out on the field after assessing how the first half went. And then I can speak to this. I'm in the third quarter of gameplay, roughly 40 to 60. And I'm starting to watch the clock. Now that I'm in the third quarter, I'm concerned about my health. I don't want to get pulled out of the game early due to an injury. And the game clock seems like it's speeding up. It's not, but it feels that way. I can only imagine how fast the clock seems to tick down in the fourth quarter, roughly 60 to 80. 
In the football game, you know, in the fourth quarter, they start skipping the huddles because all of a the sudden they realize they've got a lot of work to do, but there's not much time left on the clock. You know, early in the game, you have the mindset, well, I got my whole life to get that done. Later in the game, you still have your whole life to get that done, but what's left of your whole life gets smaller and smaller with each passing day. You know, 20 years ago, I used to say, man, when is Friday going to get here? Now I say, it's Friday already? It's 2018 already? It's February already? Seems like it just started. Seems like Christmas was two days ago. Best case scenario, time is very limited. Best case scenario. And it just gets shorter from there. And then we will all give an account of what we did with God's resources, which includes our motives for doing it. God sees the heart. This believer's judgment is different from the great white throne judgment described in Revelation chapter 20. The word for that judgment, the great white throne judgment, speaks of a punitive judgment, like a courtroom judgment. With punishment, every non-believer will give an account for why they refuse God's provision for their salvation through Jesus Christ. The believer's judgment, as we just read in Romans 14 and in 2 Corinthians 5, it uses the word bima for judgment, which is like a judgment of a contest, like Olympic judges. And awards are given to those that performed well. Except we're not in competition with each other. It's more like bracket racing. If you've ever heard of bracket racing, it's a form of drag racing. When each driver, they predict how long it'll take him to cross the finish line. And the driver that is closest to the time he predicted without going faster wins. So instead of the winner being based on raw speed, meaning the driver with the most resources will have the fastest car, and of course he'll win. On the contrary, Bracket racing is all about driving skill, reaction times, shifting abilities, the ability to control the car. It's about the driver utilizing the resources he has been given, utilizing them to the fullest extent and thereby having the best outcome. So in bracket racing, you might see a slow car like a Ford Tempo. It's common for a car like that to race a heavily modified Dodge Challenger, let's say that smokes the tires on the line, they're, they're making their run time more unpredictable. Remember, the driver calls out his time before the race has even begun, and he has to get as close to that time as possible with, without coming in under. So they're really not competing against each other. So it's much, it's much more like they're racing against the clock. It's all dependent on how well the driver utilizes the resources he has available to the fullest extent. So if the Ford Tempo says that it will take him 16 seconds to go the quarter mile and the Challenger says it'll take him eight seconds to go the quarter mile, the Tempo will get a green light and go and the Challenger, he's got to sit and wait behind a red light for the difference of the two times. So if in this case, like eight seconds, he's sitting there. And then the Challenger gets the green light and so conceivably they should make it across the finish line at the same time. We have a little video clip here. Go ahead and run it, even if we don't have sound. Oh, what a cool matchup here. So that's the Kevin Helms, the reigning Stockland Nader champion of the world, 892 for the Southland Dodge Challenger. There's the challenger. And Claude Buchanan, 1631 for the tempo. This is going to be unbelievable. Your world champ is going to like sit there for like. Eternity. And so the green light the start for got the green light, but see, the challenger is having to sit there. Jeff wait Strick, and I'm wait sorry, Cla Kevin Helms just wait ordered lunch. Wait. Now there he goes. Go. Watch this, baby. Look at Klotz at half track. Here comes that Let's challenger. Here comes that challenger. Wait. He's going to spin that car around. Boom. All see, they hit the finish line at the Eight, same time. Nine, nine, he predicted the yellow car 16 3. The champ was 16 on the tree. 31. And he was at down there and broke a hundredth of a half of a hundredth of a second too of a fast second. and so he actually lost he went in too fast there but it's the same kind of thing with us it doesn't matter you know one had a ton of horsepower one does it it doesn't matter how much of God's money you have it doesn't matter how much of God's wealth you have 
you know, often we'll say, well, if God gave me more, I'd be able to be more generous. That's not what Jesus says later in this chapter. We'll get to in a minute. He says, if you're not faithful with a little bit, you're not going to be faithful with a lot. It's not about how much God's money we're in charge of. It's, about, it's not about what talents and resources God has entrusted us with. It's not even about how much time we have left. It's all about being faithful with the resources that God has entrusted to each one of us from this point forward. You know, I don't think it would bother me one bit for God to say to me while I'm standing there in front of him giving an account. I think I would be really blessed if God said, well, Rob, you started off pretty rough, but you finished well. Good job. Wouldn't we all love to hear that? That you finished well. Luke chapter 16, verse 3 says, The manager said to himself, the master said, you're, I'm gonna, you're, you're out. He says, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me and I'm not strong enough to dig? So he's not a physical laborer kind of guy and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do so that when I'm removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, verse 5, and he began saying to the first how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. And of course, this guy's writing it, his records down too, so they match. And then the other, to the other, he said, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he acted shrewdly. The master did not praise the steward for squandering the master's resources. The master did not praise the steward for ripping him off. The master was impressed that the steward acted so shrewdly, that he acted wisely, cleverly. You see, the steward, the manager, upon realizing that this, his time was short in this stage of life, the stage where he was the manager over the master's resources, upon realizing his time was short, he utilized the resources that he had in this stage of life. He utilized them in such a way that it would be a blessing to him in the next stage of his life. Do you see the application? Do you see how this applies to us as believers in Jesus, as disciples of Jesus? Jesus is not saying to rip off our employers. Again, just to be clear, Jesus is not telling us to rip off anybody or swindle anybody or cook the books. Jesus is saying to his disciples, to you and me, he's saying utilize the resources that we have available to us in this stage of life, while here in these physical mud sacks, as Daniel calls them. Jesus is saying utilize God's wealth, God's money, the talents, the abilities, the gifts that God has given to you and the time that you have left to use them in. Jesus says, utilize these resources to their fullest extent. Here and now, so that it will be a blessing in the next stage of life. Don't be under, under the misconception that this physical life, when this physical life ends, and then the spiritual life starts. No, if you're a believer in Jesus, then you've been born again. You're already born. Your spiritual life has already started. God has already adopted you as a son or daughter. You've already been made a citizen of the kingdom of God. So when we step out of these physical bodies, it's just the next stage of life for us. And in the next stage of life, we will not have the stewardship over these physical bodies here on this physical earth with the physical money and the physical talents and the physical abilities we have. It doesn't mean we won't be stewards over something in that next stage of life. But Jesus is talking about this stage of life right now and the resources we currently have available to us. Not imagining what we would do if we had someone else's resources, but what God has given us stewardship over. And so what does that mean? You know, what am I supposed to do with these resources of God? What does God want accomplished with his resources? Well, what's the context of this discussion that Jesus is having? 
Remember, starting in chapter 14, Jesus risks his own life and heals a complete stranger. He gives this complete stranger new life, knowing the Pharisees would want to kill him for it. Jesus then tells them to humble themselves by putting others first, putting others ahead of themselves. Then Jesus tells them to invest their resources in those that can't repay you back. Jesus tells them that God has invited everyone to be a part of his kingdom. Even those hoodlums that hang out in the back alley behind the hedges. Everyone. Then Jesus explains the cost of being one of his disciples. Not only must we, be, must we be willing to give up friends and family if it comes to it, but we must be willing to give up our own possessions. Then in triplicate, triplicate, Jesus states how critically important every single lost person is to God. Using this word picture of God the Father running across the front yard with open arms to receive and embrace even the worst of us to receive and embrace us into his household, into his kingdom. Do you see it? Jesus wants us to utilize the resources he has given us in this stage of life to be a blessing in the next stage of life. He continues in chapter 16, verse 8, B, or halfway through verse 8. Jesus says, For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by mean of the wealth, means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. Jesus says that the people that are running completely on the sinful nature, the non-believers, he says they can be shrewd, they can be clever, Romans chapter 1 says they are inventors of evil. They invent ways to do evil. Now they're using their shrewdness and their cleverness to commit crimes and to, come on, to, to accomplish evil purposes. You see, they're using the resources they have, their imaginations, their talents, and their abilities, and they're using them to their fullest extent, but it's for completely selfish gain. Have you ever heard that saying, uh, you know, son, if, if you put half the effort into doing the work as you do in getting out of the work, you'd be one heck of a worker. Uh, Jesus is kind of saying something to that effect. He's saying, guys, look at the men of the world. Look at how they utilize everything they've got to accomplish evil. They wring out every last drop of what they have to accomplish completely selfish desires. They are very creative. Jesus is saying to his disciples, to us, he's saying, I want you guys to have that same enthusiasm, that same drive, that same shrewdness, that same cleverness, that same imagination in using God's resources, but I want you to use them to accomplish God's purposes, not your own. I want you to use them to physically bless the sick and the poor. I want you to put others first. The master has invited them. I want you to go out and compel them to come in. Be shrewd, clever. This is the cost of discipleship, he says, using God's resources to accomplish God's purposes. That's the cost of discipleship. Using God's resources to accomplish God's purposes, to further the eternal kingdom of God, making eternal friends for yourselves. When you step into that stage of life, you're going to be looking for the person or the people that told you about Jesus. The people that utilized God's resources to tell you about Jesus. You'll be looking for them, right? To thank them. And the ones you have told and will tell about Jesus, they will be looking for you, your eternal friends welcoming you into that next stage of life in eternal dwellings. Jesus goes on in verse 10, he who is faithful in very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, 
just means the things of this world. Who will entrust you? Who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? It's not about how much we have. It's about how faithful we are with the resources that God has, entr God has entrusted us with. You may be thinking, well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Rob. You know, you have your health. You've got a good job that pays well with good benefits. God has gifted you with the ability to at least think you can teach the word of God. You've been given so much, and I don't have anything. It doesn't seem like we even have enough money to make ends meet. And I'm certainly no Bible teacher, and I don't even have my health. I can't even leave the house. If that's the case, it sounds like God has put together quite the potential prayer warrior. Hey, you know, maybe I'm like that challenger. I've been given all this horsepower, but I'm having trouble handling it. I keep smoking the tires, I'm doing donuts, I'm slamming into the sidewalls, trying to keep this thing under control. I'm loud, making all kinds of noise, but maybe I'm not going anywhere. And here you are, that Ford Tempo, purring like a kitten, perfect throttle response, smooth shifting, squeezing every drop of resource that car has to offer. We're not competing with each other. God has entrusted us with a certain amount of his resources. And he is expecting a certain amount to be accomplished for the kingdom of God in relation to the amount of resources we've been given. If it's a little, then be faithful with that little. If it's a lot, then be faithful with that lot. God's desire is that the challenger and the tempo, that they would cross the finish line at the same exact time both squeezing out every drop of resource that was given to them. It's not about how much of God's money we're in charge of. It's not about what talents and what resources that God has entrusted us with. It's not even about how much time we have left. It's all about being faithful with the resources that God has entrusted to each one of us from this point forward. We can't change the past, but we can move on from now. Verse 13, Jesus says, and we'll close with this verse, No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or, he, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You can't serve God and serve wealth. You can't serve God, God, and serve God's resources. Let me flip-flop that. You can't have God as your master and have God's resources as your master. Sounds absolutely ridiculous when you put it that way, right? When you flip-flop it. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying it's, it's one or the other. It can't be both. We either have our eyes fixed on God and he is leading and directing our lives, guiding us and instructing us in the use of the resources that he has entrusted us with to further the kingdom of God. Or we have our eyes fixed on the resources. We're not looking at God. And like the steward of this parable, we're, we're squandering the master's resources, wasting the master's resources on selfish desire, selfish gain. Jesus is saying halfway doesn't work. Because it's a rub. It, it rubs you raw. It's a major conflict. Jesus says you'll end up being devoted to one and despising the other because they're opposite. They don't, it doesn't work together like that. So why don't we just end the rub and devote ourselves to God and allow him to direct the use of his resources, however much or however little they are. Jesus is saying, guys, look at these men of the world. Look at how they utilize everything they've got to accomplish evil. They wring out every last drop of what they have to accomplish completely selfish de desires. Elaborate plans for, for robberies and heists and amazing how much, how clever and how 
how much energy and thought men will put into sinning. Jesus is saying to his disciples, to us, to you and me, he's saying, I want you guys to have that same enthusiasm, that same drive, that same shrewdness, that same cleverness, the same imagination in using God's resources, but I want you to use them for God's purposes, not for your own. I want you to use them to physically bless the sick and the poor. I want you to put others first. The master has invited them. I want you to go out and compel them to come in. Be shrewd about it. Be clever. Jesus says, this is the cost of discipleship. Using God's resources to accomplish God's purposes. To further the eternal kingdom of God. Making eternal friends for ourselves. And the result will be when, when you step into that stage of life. Those that have been blessed by God's resources through you, they will be there thanking you, welcoming you into that next stage of life in eternal dwellings. And God will be there loving on them. Those people that you and I compelled to come into the kingdom. I can picture the Lord with his arms around them. Those people that were once lost, but now have been found. And God, may, maybe he'll say something to the effect, thank you for bringing my son home to me. We don't know. Let's pray. Lord, we're so unworthy, Lord, of your blessing and your grace and your mercy and your resources, Lord, but... You give them to us anyway. Lord, you bless us anyway. And we're so thankful for that. And Lord, I ask that you help us. It, it's, this life can be so distracting. It can be so difficult, Lord. Help us to see clearly how you would have us spend your resources, Lord. We know we, have, we need roofs over our heads and transportation and all of that kind of thing, Lord. We, you use those things to get us around so you can use us in the workplace and in the neighborhoods and in the shopping centers and in the schools and wherever we are, Lord. So, Lord, I'm asking not for, do not give us, uh, help us not to make ourselves feel guilty, Lord. But help us to listen and to hear you clearly on what you would have for us, on how you would have us use those resources. Help us to be clever. Help us to be shrewd. And be with us, Lord, this week. Fill us with your spirit. Keep us completely full, Lord, and use us in mighty ways. I know you want to, Lord. Help us to allow you to use us. And we thank you, God, for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.